Fittingly, English football's shining beacon was born out of some of the darkest days in the country's footballing history. In the 1970s and 80s, the sport was characterised by chronic financial mismanagement and a lack of commercial awareness. There was significantly limited live TV coverage, meaning that clubs had to rely on matchday income such as ticket sales to survive. Football authorities were afraid that if matches were broadcast live, attendances would decline, meaning that clubs would lose out on their most crucial revenue stream. And the leagues were also littered with old, decaying and dangerous stadiums which set the scene for various societal issues, including rampant hooliganism. As the BBC uncovered in a 1977 episode of Panorama, hooliganism was strongly associated with extreme racist political groups such as the National Front. The initial response to hooliganism was aggressive policing of football supporters. Ken Bates, the owner of Chelsea Football Club, responded to violence at Stamford Bridge by applying to the local council to erect an electric fence in front of one stand. His application, unsurprisingly, was rejected. The dark ages of English football reached its lowest ebbs in the late 1980s. In 1985, during a match between Bradford and Lincoln City, a fire broke out which, within four minutes, had engulfed the entire main stand, killing 56 supporters and injuring 265. In the same year, English football's hooliganism reputation worsened after rioting at the European Cup final between Liverpool and Juventus caused a section of the stadium to collapse, killing 39 Juventus fans and injuring 600. The incidents at Heysel Stadium saw English clubs banned from European competition for five years and Liverpool for six. In 1989, during an FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest at Hillsborough Stadium, 96 Liverpool fans lost their lives and 766 were injured when negligent organisation allowed a crush to develop in the standing-only pens in the Leppings Lane stand. Such seismic occurrences forced central government to intervene. The Taylor Report was published in 1990. It's best remembered for recommending that Stadia become all-seater, but also banned alcohol consumption in view of the pitch, and prompted football to move upmarket as to follow the affluent middle class in his or her pursuits and aspirations, as detailed in the FA's blueprint for the future of football in 1991. Modernisation was seen as the key driving force for the development of English football and set the foundations for the Premier League's classy and global brand. And also relevant to the Premier League's birth was the declining relationship between the Football League and the FA. With commercialisation growing in the 1980s and 90s, shirt sponsorship was only permitted from the early 80s onwards, political tension festered between those sharing the game's regulatory power. David Dean, Arsenal's then deputy chairman, was a huge advocate of America's razzmatazz sport industry and was frustrated by the lack of commercial imagination in English football's hierarchy. In 1988, Dean and other executives from Manchester United, Everton, Liverpool and Tottenham Hotspur met with the chief executive of London Weekend Television and chairman of ITV Sport, Greg Dyke, over the prospect of selling their rights, effectively forming a breakaway competition. The Football League, however, found out about the coup and quickly sold their rights to ITV Sport at a cut-down price to prevent a breakaway. In reaction to the threat of being left behind, the Football League published a report, One Team, One Game, One Voice, in 1990, in which they called for more cooperation with the FA and a holistic approach to developing all of English football's professional leagues. Meanwhile, Dean and Liverpool's Noel White approached the FA's chairman, Graham Kelly, with another proposal for secession from the Football League, which was well received. In response to the Football League's report, the FA's blueprint for the future of football rejected the proposals and consolidated itself as the controlling governing body of English football. It also listed the potential benefits of a new breakaway top division, something that would significantly weaken the Football League's influence. The justifications for the creation of the Premier League, listed in blueprint, were that a new isolated top division would put an end to power struggles in the game, improve the image of the sport, enhance the prospects of success for the England team, improve the chances of further funding from the government and deliver enhanced commercial benefits. And on the 5th of April 1991, the FA announced its plans for a breakaway league, shifting the power of influence from the Football League to the FA. Meetings were held with representatives of the top division clubs to discuss the fine details of the new competition, where, somewhat surprisingly, the FA ceded control to the clubs. Sir Bert Millikit, chairman of the FA, when asked about the optimum number of teams in the competition replied it's your league, you decide. Alex Flynn, an executive from Saatchi & Saatchi, commissioned to help oversee the organisation of the league, was cutting in his assessment of the FA. They were a poorly run organisation, he recalled. They felt that their way of doing things was threatened by the Football League, and their first priority was to head that off. 
In backing breakaway clubs, they saw a way to destroy the power of the Football League. All I can say is that they were incompetent and that they had no vision. How could a 42-game league help the England team? After Sir Burt's fateful words, the clubs needed no further intervention. They met in private to organise their new competition under the stewardship of Rick Parry and created the Founders Agreement, the most fundamental aspects of which were the democratisation of the league, any changes to the competition would be decided on by the clubs who each had one vote, and there had to be a two-thirds majority, and also the new redistribution of television rights and the legal separation from the FA. In 1992, the Premier League, named to sound less threatening than the originally branded Super League, was established for its debut season.